Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, where we talk about mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. My name is Vic Shy, and in this video, I'll be going over the newly released Netflix original horror film, No One Gets Out Alive. Allegedly, No One Gets Out Alive is the movie adaptation of the 2014 novel of the same name, written by British author Adam Neville. Neville also wrote the book which inspired the beloved Netflix original film, The Ritual. The film tells the story of an undocumented immigrant from Mexico named Ambar, who moves into a boarding house in Cleveland after the death of her mother. Ambar must overcome demons from her past while facing off against the scariest thing of all, the US job market. All while living in a cheap, creepy boarding house with strange residents and mysterious things hiding in the night. I'll be explaining the events that take place throughout the film and giving my interpretation of the ending and its meaning. I'll also be explaining the connection of this film and 2017's The Ritual and why these two films are set in the same universe. No One Gets Out Alive explores themes of grief, sacrifice, and the struggles that undocumented immigrants face for simply trying to live a better life. If you enjoy this video, make sure to click the like button and help keep me from having to face the intimidating job market. But without further ado, sit back and relax and join me as we explore this strange and creepy boarding house, and no one gets out alive. Allegedly, our movie begins with old camera footage from 1963 showing an excavation somewhere in Mexico led by a professor named Arthur Wells. A stone box is discovered, surrounded by moths and brought to the surface. In the present day, a woman is having a phone conversation in Portuguese and expresses her regret about having left home. She says that she has been having bad dreams and wants to come home. In the background, a TV is broadcasting a news report about illegal immigration into the US. The lights suddenly go out and the mysterious stone box appears before her before she is presumably killed off screen by a ghostly woman. We meet our main character, Ambar, who is illegally smuggled into Cleveland, Ohio from Mexico. She has no legal documents which keep her from being able to obtain a decent job. She currently works at a sewing factory and has a really douchey boss. She sees a flyer on a bulletin advertising a boarding house with cheap rooms only for women. She moves into the creepy boarding house and meets the owner, Red Wells, who recently inherited the house from his father, Professor Arthur Wells. Her only current roommate is a woman named Freya who doesn't speak much English. Where's she from? No, they don't speak English. Touche, Red. He shows her to her room and goes over a couple basic house rules. Ambar must pay a deposit worth of one month's rent up front, which if we look back at the ad in the newspaper, is $1,000. She is reluctant to pay the hefty deposit, but sees no other choice. Ambar listens to a voice message on her phone left by her deceased mother and also has dreams about the time she spent with her in the hospital. She runs into Freya in the hallway and her English seems a little better than Red let on. Red is full of shit. Apparently, we see two ghosts standing on the floors above looking down, which eerily reminded me of Lisa from Silent Hills PT. Ambar's co-worker Kinsey knows a guy who can make her a fake ID from Texas at the cost of $3,000. She has dinner with her uncle Beto and his family, who sets her up with a job interview but says it is important she brings her ID. She returns home wearing a warm coat given to her by her aunt and is drawn to a sound coming from the locked basement. She goes to investigate and sees scratch marks on the door frame, which is is never a good sign. Red tells her that the basement is off limits and she asks him for her deposit back, needing it to pay for her ID. Now, this next scene took me completely by surprise and blew my mind. A radio broadcast briefly talks about four friends that went missing in the Swedish wilderness. This is a reference to the 2017 Netflix original horror film, The Ritual, and shows that these two films take place in the same universe. It refers to Luke, Hutch, Dom, and Phil, who went hiking in the Swedish wilderness after the death of their friend Robert. The lads were eventually killed one by one by a mysterious monster-like demigod named Modar. Dom was offered as a sacrifice to Modar by a crazy cult who fear and worship the god in exchange for eternal life. Luke came face to face with Modar and was able to escape from the creature by facing his personal demons and overcoming his cowardice. <laughs> However, according to the broadcast in this film, all four friends are still missing, showing that Luke never made it home and leaving his fate a mystery. If you look at the top left of the screen, you can actually see the ritual playing on the TV on top of the refrigerator in the background. 
Both books that these films are adapted from were written by British author Adam Neville, which supports the theory that they take place in the same universe. That night, she has another dream of her mother in the hospital, but this time, the stone box makes an unexpected cameo. She has a conversation with Kinsey where she reveals that she lied to her uncle about her citizenship status for the job. We learn that Ambar's mother was constantly getting sick and she kept having to put her own future on hold to take care of her. She states that once her mother passed, she felt relieved and that she could finally start her own life. Like the good friend she is, Kinsey offers to put up her own money to cover the rest of the ID cost. Ambar, extremely grateful, gives Kinsey the money for her ID. On her way home, we see that Ambar Ambar is being followed by the ghost of her mother. She comes home and finds Red's brother Becker, banging his head on the basement door and mumbling something. Becker later stands in front of her room and leaves the white hand of Saruman on her door. Ambar meets two Romanian women, Maria and Petra, who are possibly prostitutes and go have some fun in Red's room. While Red is distracted, Ambar sneaks into his father's study. She listens to a creepy audio tape explaining some type of ritual involving the sacrifice of the elderly, women, and children. She sees a picture of Arthur and Mary Wells along with the mysterious stone box taken in Tenochtitlan, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire. The next day, Ambar discovers that Kinsey quit the factory and isn't answering any of her phone calls. It becomes clear that Kinsey was playing Ambar all along and scammed her of her money, making this one of the top 5 anime betrayals. Her luck goes from bad to worse when she is then fired from her job. That night while taking a shower, she hears the faint screams of a woman yelling for help coming from the drain. She briefly sees what appears to be Freya and her shower curtain, but Red says she moved out a couple days ago. He also says that he is now willing to give her back the deposit. Um, tomorrow. I would have been like, no dude, not tomorrow, now. Well now, well now, stop. well now, you well now, stop. well now, please stop. I can't let you get close. In one of the film's creepiest scenes, Ambar sees the crying ghost of a young woman pleading with another ghost named Mary. Mary says that she must prepare her or Arthur will hurt them both. Ambar is obviously frightened but keeps walking towards the sound of her cries. My friends, if I hear crying, I start running. The ghost of the young woman is then suddenly grabbed by a large hand and dragged into the basement. Please let me. Ah! She calls her uncle Beto to tell him the truth about her citizenship and begs him to come pick her up. Unfortunately, Uncle Beto is out of town and she is going to have to make it on her own for a few days. She is plagued by further eerie visions of her mother, whose facial expressions seem almost judgmental. She meets Red at a diner where he tells her that he left her money back at the house. He says that he and Becker had a disagreement over giving her back the money, and Red appears to have a cut on his lip and a couple of bruises on his face. Becker is much more physically imposing than Red and most likely beats on his brother when they have a disagreement. Red brings Ambar back back to the house, and just as everyone probably suspected, it was a trap. I was gonna help you. Get I hope you know that part was true. Becker enters the room looking intimidating as hell and chants the same phrase previously heard on the tape in the study. Maria and Petra retreat into Ambar's room and all three plan to leave when Becker and Red are asleep. They tell Ambar that they too have been experiencing nightmares and have also seen the mysterious stone box. Ambar wakes up from another nightmare to the brothers trying to take Maria and Petra away. Uncle Beto suddenly arrives at the residence looking for Ambar. He notices Ambar's coat behind him and rushes into the house to look for her. I know that it was his emotional and compulsive reaction to run in and rescue his niece, but the smart thing to do would have been to retreat and call the police. He just ran inside of the house completely unaware of the dangers inside and could have avoided this. <laughs>
In this movie's insane climax, it is revealed that Red and Becker have been luring women with cheap rent only to use them as sacrifice in an ancient Aztec ritual. They have been sacrificing women to the Aztec goddess Itzpapalotl, who has been inhabiting the stone box all along. The stone box was taken from Tenochtitlan by Professor Wells and brought back to their home in America. Unbeknownst to the professor, the stone box contained Itzpapalotl, the Aztec goddess of death and rebirth. Professor Professor Wells became insane because of the box's influence and began luring women to the home as sacrifice to the goddess. His wife Mary initially helped the professor in luring the woman, but was eventually killed and sacrificed by the professor himself. Ambar previously saw an exact moment in time depicting Mary preparing a young woman for the ritual. I must prepare you, or Arthur will hurt us both. Red and Becker moved back into their family home after Becker became ill and could not afford the medical bills. They discovered the horrible things their father had done and killed him. However, Becker also became influenced by the box and continued to sacrifice women to the goddess. In return for each sacrifice offered to the goddess, Becker's illness gradually got better. The ritual was hinted at and briefly explained on the audio tape from Professor Wells. A picture depicting the ritual in Itzpapalotl was also seen inside of a book in the study. The back of Becker's head has very thick pulsating veins which seem to imply that he is actually being possessed by the goddess to do her bidding. This would explain why both he and his father were chanting in an ancient language. While he doesn't appear to have lost complete control, he has lost all his sense of reasoning. Ambar is carried off by Becker and we see the ghosts of all the women who were previously sacrificed, showing that the ghosts in the house weren't the actual threat and instead appear to the living woman as a warning. She is chained to a stone table and Becker drags away the decapitated body of Maria. He begins chanting the ancient language and opens the stone box revealing revealing one embarrassing snapshot of Spongebob at the Christmas party! Not quite Patrick, but thank you. The inside of the box reveals a long dark tunnel, showing that Eats Papa Lot doesn't actually inhabit the box itself. Rather, the box acts as a passage and extension to the mythical world the goddess inhabits, Tamo and Chan. Several Rothschildia moths commonly associated with the goddess fly out of the box and were constantly seen throughout the film following Ambar. Similar to Modar from The Ritual, Itzpapalotl is able to play visual mind tricks with its victims by preying on their emotional trauma. The goddess tricks Ambar into thinking Uncle Beto is still alive. This shows that the goddess possibly likes to prey on her victims and give them a false sense of hope right before killing them. In reality, Ambar is fast asleep on the stone table, having another dream of being with her mother in the hospital. In a truly chilling scene, the goddess emerges from the box and reveals her true form. Similar to the amazing creature design of Modar, Itzpapalot looks absolutely intimidating and breathtaking. <laughs> You're breathtaking! As the goddess approaches Ambar preparing to kill her, we see that she is using Ambar's guilt toward her mother as bait to keep her asleep. Ambar, realizing that this is all a trick and that she must wake up, smothers her mother with a pillow. She kills the vision of her mother which wakes her up and causes the goddess to retreat. Now, we are never told what her mother's exact illness was or how she died as Ambar always kept it very vague. Mommy got sick and then she'd get better and things would get bad again and Ambar seemingly kills her mother in the vision but I believe that this actually occurred in real life throughout the film Ambar is being followed and haunted by her mother's ghost she appears physically different than the other ghosts and gives Ambar some pretty judgmental looks it is my belief that Ambar's weakness is not from the grief of losing her mother but in fact from the guilt of killing her this is what the goddess is preying on and utilizing against Ambar but why would she kill her mom in a conversation with with Kinsey, Ambar states, I was relieved when it was all over. I could finally leave for any start. She kept having to put her own plans and future on hold to take care of her dying mother. She decided to put her out of her misery and move on with her life. This is evident in her reaction to when Kinsey says, I love them, but life would be so much easier without them. 
when Umbar kills her mom in her dream, she is acknowledging and finally comes to terms with the terrible thing she has done. This weakens the goddess's grasp on Umbar and forces her to retreat. This is just like when Luke came to terms with his role in Robert's death in the ritual. Both Modar and Itzpapalot exploited the main character's guilt and emotional trauma and used it against them. Both Luke and Umbar successfully overcome their personal demons and defeat their respective god. Modar and Itzpapalot are both worshipped by those willing to sacrifice others for their own health and the promise of eternal life. Itzpapalot is known as the goddess of death and rebirth. She needs an offering in form of a sacrifice and in turn gives life to the individual performing the ritual. Ambar takes a look inside of the box and sees the small skeleton of Itzpapalot, seemingly defeated from having unsuccessfully killed Ambar. As she is about to leave the house, she hears the screams of Petra struggling with Becker. She sees an old Aztec sword displayed on the wall called a Makwawilt. The sword is made of wood and has several sharp obsidian stones embedded on its side. Becker feels that something is wrong and tells Red to go check. Something's different. He says this because the sacrifice was unsuccessful and he did not receive its benefits. Red steps outside the room and gets absolutely wrecked by Ambar. Becker is much more physically imposing and throws Ambar to the ground. He then brutally steps on and breaks her ankle, just like he did her uncle. With Becker distracted, Petra attempts to flee, but it doesn't go so well for her. <laughs> Becker then tries to choke the life out of Ambar, but she manages to slice his neck using a piece of obsidian. She then finishes him off Mortal Kombat style by bashing his head in multiple times with a Makwawilt. Ambar sacrifices Red to eat Papalot as retribution for everything he and his brother have done. Red's head is then bitten clean off by the goddesses teeth. The goddess stays true to her title of death and rebirth, as she initially withered away in defeat but was reborn when she was offered another sacrifice. In the film's final scene, Ambar limps away victorious and now sees the ghost of Red, now bound to the house just like the previous woman he sacrificed. As she approaches the front doors, her ankle is magically healed as a result of having offered Red to the goddess. Her face now displays the same pulsating veins as the back of Becker's head, showing that the goddess now holds influence over her. While initially appearing relieved, her expression turns to that of despair and possibly regret. She realizes that she is now bound to the goddess and must keep sacrificing the lives of others in order to live as the movie ends. This is a very bittersweet ending for Ambar in my opinion. Even though she survived, she must now sacrifice the lives of others in order to live on. This is a direct contrast to her previously having to sacrifice and put her own life on hold for someone else. In a sense, this serves as a form of punishment for killing her own mother. On the other hand, she practically has her own house now and doesn't have to worry about struggling anymore. She also has the chance to help other undocumented immigrants by offering them a home, given she doesn't offer them up as a sacrifice. She could, in a way, become a vigilante and sacrifice those who prey on and take advantage of undocumented immigrants, just like Red and Becker did. They lured defenseless women they knew had nowhere else to go and that no one would come looking for, a tragic reflection of the very real horrors of human smuggling and trafficking. And that was No One Gets Out Alive. My friends, this was a very enjoyable movie that followed a similar narrative structure to The Ritual, which makes sense being that they are both based on books by the same author. The film was beautifully shot and had a really touching story of overcoming personal struggles and trying to make it in this cold and cruel world. Just like The Ritual before it, the creature design of Eats Papa was definitely the highlight of the film and deserves praise and recognition. I definitely recommend this film to horror fans looking for an engaging story that explores real life horror still going on today. But ladies and gentlemen, as always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you all for tuning in and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.